The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the ninth verse of that chapter which we have read together at the beginning, namely the sixth chapter of the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. The ninth verse in the sixth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Galatians. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now those who attend here regularly Sunday mornings will understand at once why it is that we propose to consider together this morning that particular verse. We've been spending many Sunday mornings together, indeed since the second Sunday morning of this present year, in considering what we have described as spiritual depression, namely that condition which afflicts so many of God's people, alas, to which we are all subject, and from which undoubtedly we have all at some time or another suffered. A condition in which we are depressed, Truly Christian, definitely spiritual, but depressed Christians, and at times even meriting the term miserable Christians. And we are considering this for the good reason that not only is it something which is terribly and tragically wrong in and of itself, but still more important at a time like this with the world as it is, in all its godlessness and chaos and trouble. There is nothing which is more tragic than the fact that God's own people should be failing to stand out as great signposts indicating the true way of life and of living to the masses of the people. So that from every standpoint this is a condition which we must examine in order that we may discover the causes of it and apply the appropriate remedy which is provided for us somewhere or another in the pages of the scriptures. Now we've been looking at these various causes. The Bible is full of this kind of thing. It's a book that has been written in order that God's people may be helped in this world. That's why it is written. And that is especially true of all these New Testament epistles. They were all written because of some situation that had arisen. The way to view them is not to think of a man who was primarily a literary man sitting in a study and writing a great treatise. Not at all. This Apostle Paul was an evangelist, a man who traveled about and a teacher. And he generally writes his letters because of some trouble somewhere. And in order to help people to understand the cause of their trouble and the way, I say, to overcome it. And so they deal with all these possible causes. We can be quite certain of this that there is no cause of spiritual depression today, but that it's dealt with in the scriptures. The rules and the laws of the spiritual life are always the same. They never vary. The appearances differ. The particular guise in which the difficulty may appear before us may change, but the thing itself is constant and it never varies because the cause of it all, the devil, never varies. Very well, then, here I say this morning we come to yet another cause of this condition of spiritual depression. And at once it reminds us of something that we've had occasion to underline several times before, namely the terrible subtlety of our adversary. Now, the last two Sunday mornings we've been looking together at the way in which the devil tempts men tempts Christian people to go off the rails and makes them miserable by uh, suggesting false teachings to them. It's a very clever way that putting certain things in the center which shouldn't be there or giving us some new kind of religion which is a mixture of various religions, the Colossian heresy that we were considering together last Sunday morning. But now this morning, you see, we're in quite a different uh, climate altogether. At this point, he is not concerned so much about the danger of going astray after some heresy, some error, uh, taking up some cult and believing that that is the true faith. That's not what he's concerned about at all. 
It's in a way something that is even more subtle than that. Because there is uh, ostensibly and on the surface nothing wrong at all, apparently. But you see, what happens here is that people just become weary and tired while still on the rails, still going in the right direction. Here is the case of those not who deviate and go off in this direction or that direction or even turn back. No, they're, they're going on the right road and they're facing in the right way, but uh, oh, it's the way they're doing it. They're shuffling along with their heads and their hands drooping. They are, as it were, moving along, and yet the whole spectacle, the picture they present, is uh, in and of itself the very antithesis of what the Christian is meant to be in this life and in this world. Now, perhaps the best way of looking at this uh, tendency on our part to weariness is to look at it, uh, first of all, in general. This is what we may call the danger of the middle period. The danger of the middle period. It's something which is true, not only in the Christian life as such, in the spiritual life, it's true of the whole of life. This uh, problem of uh, middle life, if you like, middle age, the middle period, it's uh, something which is evident on all hands. It's something that we all have to face sooner or later, just as we grow older from year to year. There is great attention being paid to young people today, and there is a considerable amount of attention being paid to old people. But I am perfectly convinced and I say this on the basis of my experience with others and of my reading, that the most difficult period of all is the middle period. Because it has certain factors which enter in, which make it peculiarly difficult. There are certain compensations in youth, and there are compensations in old age, which seem to be almost entirely lacking in this middle period. So I say it's something that uh, we all tend to encounter just as we get older. A certain resilience, a certain vigor, a certain buoyancy in a physical sense tends to go. And one is aware of a slowing and a slackening of one's power and of one's pace. I needn't develop it. It's something with which we are familiar in theory, if not in actual experience and practice. It's exactly the same also, is it not, in connection oftentimes with a man's work or profession. And that is what constitutes a problem to so many such people. It means, you see, that you've got beyond that stage of developing and building up. And you've arrived at a certain level. And you seem incapable of advancing beyond that, as I've just been saying, for certain physical reasons, perhaps alone. And there you are, on this level. You're no longer climbing. You've arrived somewhere. And the difficulty is to keep going at that level, lacking the stimulus that took you to the level. It's often happened with a man in business. It is sometimes much more difficult to maintain a business than it is to build it up. Everything seems to be with you, in a sense, as you're building up. It's when you've arrived at that point, you lose a certain stimulus. And you find it extremely difficult to hold it and to keep going. Well, I say that I could illustrate this almost endlessly, taking it purely from the natural life and from our experience in work and in profession and in various other things. I think as you read the biographies of men, even the most successful men that the world has ever known, in any branch or in any department, they will all, in a sense, testify together in saying that that was, of all periods in their life, the most difficult of all. But now this is all so true also of the religious life and of the spiritual life. It's the stage which follows the initial experience. That initial experience in which everything was new and everything was surprising and everything was wonderful and everything was thrilling. 
the stage in which one was constantly making new discoveries. And these discoveries never seem to come to an end, but suddenly one is conscious of the fact that they do seem to have come to an end. And one becomes accustomed to the Christian life. And one is no longer surprised by things as one was at the beginning because one is simply familiar with them. One knows about them. So that all that element which uh, kept us going, as it were, so much in the early stages suddenly seems to have gone. Nothing seems to be happening. There doesn't seem to be any change. There doesn't seem to be any advance. There doesn't seem to be any development. Now, this may be true of us individually, it may be true of our work, it may be true of a church, it may be true of a whole collection of people, it may be true of a missionary society, and so on. I'm given to understand, and I know it is the truth, that this uh, particular question to which I'm adverting does happen to be one of the major problems in connection with the foreign mission work. And missionaries who spent their time abroad will all know exactly what I mean by the things I'm saying at this present time. It is just that point when you've got over the newness and the surprise of the new country, the new climate, the new language, the thrill and the excitement of doing something you've never done before, and you just settle down into your routine, into your regular daily work of doing the same thing day after day, then this trial arises. And you no longer are carried over it by that initial momentum which seemed to take you through it all in the early stages and at the beginning. Now that, I say, is the condition with which the apostle is dealing here. And perhaps to make it all worse and to aggravate it, there may be troubles, difficulties pressing upon you. Other people may add to your troubles. They may do things they shouldn't do or not do what they should do. There may be trials and difficulties and troubles all around you on top of this. You yourself are entering this middle period and then these things happen to you in addition. And the result is that one becomes weary in well-doing. Now, I mustn't take any more time in describing the condition. And yet it is so important that we should understand exactly what it is. There it is, I say, the point at which the stage of development and of advance seems to have come to an end. And you're in some kind of doldrums when it's difficult to tell whether the ship is moving at all, either backwards or forwards. It just seems to be set and fixed. And nothing at all seems to be taking place. Now, there's no doubt at all that these Galatian Christians uh, had at any rate, some of them arrived at that particular point. There is no doubt at all that their particular heresy, which we looked at a fortnight ago, had something to do with this. It always has a depressing effect. That's why we must be always careful about heresies and errors. Ultimately, they will lead to this depression, and then we become depressed in the work. Very well, then. Now, let's define it like this, perhaps. We are considering people who are not so much tired of the work as tired in it. Be not weary in well-doing. Very well, that's the condition. What do we say about it and what do we do about it? Well, there is no aspect of this great problem in which the negative is more important than it is on this particular occasion. Whenever we find in this position of weariness spiritually, before we begin to do anything positive, there are certain negatives, I say, that are absolutely all important. And the first of them is this. Whatever you may feel like, don't listen to the suggestions that come to you from all directions. I don't mean so much from people as from within yourself and voices that seem to be speaking round and about you. Don't listen to them when they tell you to give up or to give way or to give in. That is the temptation that comes at that point always. You say, I just can't go on. I'm too weary, I'm too tired, I can't possibly. The thing's too much for me. And there's nothing to say at that point, I say, but this direct negative. You've always got to start with these conditions on the very lowest level, and that is the lowest level. You say to yourself, whatever else happens, I'm going on. You don't give up, you don't give way. 
But that perhaps isn't the greatest danger. The greatest danger is the one which I'm going to put in the form of my second negative injunction. Don't resign yourself to it. That's the real danger. There is the danger, of course, of giving up and turning back and going out. There are people who have done that. That's backsliding. There are the people who hand in the resignations and say, I'm quitting, I'm finished with it. But that isn't the case with the majority. The danger with the majority at this point is, is just to resign themselves to it. And uh, to lose heart and to lose hope. Yes, they will go on, but they'll go on in this weary, helpless dragging condition. Uh, to put it more spiritually, let me put it like this. The danger at this point is to say something like this to yourself. Well, I've lost that something which I had. And obviously I'll never have that back again. So I'll just go on. I'll go on formally. I'll go on out of habit. I'll go on out of custom. I'll go on as a sheer matter of duty. I've lost the thrill, I've lost the enjoyment, I've lost the abandon. That's gone, and it's undoubtedly gone forever. Well, what do I do? Well, I've just got to put up with it. I'll resign myself to my fate, I'll stick it, I won't be a quitter, I won't turn my back, I won't resign, I won't go out. But I'll go on, I will go on, but I'll go on, well, feeling rather hopeless about it all. Just the spirit of resignation. Stoicism, if you like. Putting up with it. Yes, I'm going down the road. I'm just shuffling down the road. I'm not walking with head erect as I once was, but I'll just go on in that way. Now, I think that that is the greatest danger of all. And again, I suggest to you that it is something that is a danger not only at the spiritual level, which we are most concerned about here, it's a danger at every single level in life. You can run your business like that, you can work like that in your profession. You can live like that in any sense you like. You've really said to yourself, the golden hours have gone. The great days belong to the past. I'll never know that again, but I'll just... Keep on keeping on. I'll just go on. There's something, of course, at first that seems very wonderful about it. There's something that seems almost heroic about it, but you notice I'm putting it as a negative. I suggest it's the very temptation of the devil. If he can get us just to go on as formal Christians who've lost their hope and lost their joy and lost their vigor, he'll be very well content indeed. And as I see things today, this is perhaps the greatest danger of all confronting the Christian church. The danger of continuing in a formal spirit as a matter of duty. Yes, going on, but wearily trudging along instead of walking as we ought to walk. And then that brings me to my third and my last negative, which I think you will recognize again is a very dangerous one. The third thing against which we warn ourselves is that when we thus feel weary and tired, if there is one thing above everything else we mustn't do, it is this. Never resort to artificial stimulants. You know the temptation, don't you? It's been the ruination of many a man. Who, as I say, has built up a profession or a business or something like that. Then he gets into this stage I'm describing. And he is conscious that he hasn't the vigor and the whim that he had. He doesn't feel, as the phrase has it, that he's on top of his job. And he doesn't know what to do because he's not neglecting anything as far as he can tell. And somebody comes along and suggests to him, look here, he says, what you need is some sort of a tonic. Some kind of a fillip. The whole danger of drink and of alcohol comes in at that very, at, at that very point. Many a man has ended in a drunkard's grave who started like that. He didn't take drink for the sake of drink, not because he liked it, not because he wanted it, not even to be convivial. He just did it because he felt it's the only way I can carry on. If I don't have a stimulus, I'm done for. I can't continue. It was suggested to him it may have come into his mind, and he did it. He resorted to an artificial stimulant. And of course it seems so plausible. 
you feel to yourself, if only I could get something just to lift me a little, then all would be well with me. People take to drugs, they take to drink and various other things in precisely that way. But my friends, this has a very important and a very vital spiritual application. I have seen many people in the church dealing with this condition of spiritual weariness in that very way. They work up in excitement. They'll adopt a new method. They say, now we must rouse ourselves out of this, so we'll put on something. They put on a new program, something additional. Uh, haven't you seen it sometimes on the very advertisements outside certain church buildings? Can't you think of certain churches? You always find some fresh announcement outside, some new attraction, the visit of this or that, or uh, something marvelous, come and see it, and so on. A church which is obviously living on artificial stimulants. And it's all being done with this idea in mind. Uh, so the, the, the pastor or somebody else responsible has said to himself, well now we are just not moving, we are becoming rather dead and uh, things are becoming formal. Now what can we do about this? Well, he says, look here, let's get this in. It'll cause a stir, it'll be a new interest, it'll provide an excitement. I think there's been a great deal of this. And my whole suggestion this morning is that that kind of thing in the spiritual life and in the life of the church is comparable to one thing only on the natural level, and that is to the man who takes to drink, or to drugs, or to some excitement. Something to work himself up. Now, obviously, that again is an extremely subtle temptation and a very subtle danger. It seems to be so plausible. It seems just the thing we need. And yet, of course, the terrible fallacy behind all this is simply, in a scientific sense, that what you're really doing is to exhaust yourself still more. The more the man relies upon the drink or the drug or whatever it is, the more really he's draining away his own vital energy. And ultimately, he'll be more exhausted, so he must have more drink and more stimulus and more drug. And it's exactly the same at the spiritual level. I've seen many a church which, having started along this particular course, simply finds that it has to go on doing it. The people will ask for more. If once you resort to the artificial, more and more will be required and desired, and you'll have to have more and more. And your life is kept going by this kind of thing. Well, now there are the three negatives which I regard as of supreme importance. Let us turn to the positive. Avoiding those three dangers and pitfalls, what do we do? Here we are, we are weary in well-doing. What do we do about it? Well, I say the first thing is self-examination. Start by examining yourself. Don't walk out, I say. Don't just say, well, it can't be helped. I'll have to carry on the rest of my life like this. Or don't take your stimulus. Stop for a moment, sit down, and say to yourself, well, now then, why am I weary? What's the cause of my weariness? It's surely the obvious question. You see, you don't treat a thing before you've diagnosed it. You don't apply a remedy until you know exactly what the cause is. It is the most fatal thing to do, medically speaking, to rush to treatments before you know exactly the condition with which you're dealing. So you must examine, you must diagnose, you must inquire, and you say, well, why am I weary? What's the matter with me? Why have I got into this condition? Well, now there may be endless answers at this point. I can't hope to give you them all, but here's one of them. You may be in that condition simply because you're working too hard. Physical. Purely physical. You can, I say, be tired in the work and not tired of the work. It is possible that a man has been working, I don't care what realm, whether the natural or the spiritual, he's been so overdraining and overtaxing his energy and his resources that he's just down physically. If you work too hard or under a strain, you're bound to suffer. And of course, if that is the cause of your trouble, the remedy is obvious. You need a rest. You need physical attention. You need medical treatment. Now, my friends, that is sometimes the case. There's a great and notable example of it in the Old Testament, the case of Elijah. You remember when he had this kind of attack. He sits under his juniper tree. But the real thing that he needed at that time, you remember, was sleep and food, and God gave him both. 
He gave him the food and the rest before he gave him the spiritual treatment. It's a recognized principle in the scriptures. And it's obvious when you come to think of life. But wait a minute, leaving that out, let's assume that it isn't that. What else may be the cause of this trouble? Well, another very frequent cause is this. We may have been living our Christian life or doing our Christian work by means of carnal energy. We may have been doing it all. Instead of working in the power of the Spirit, we may have been working with a mere carnal, human, and perhaps even physical energy. We may have been trying to do God's work ourselves. And of course, if we try to do that, there can be only one result. It will eventually crush us. It's such exalted and such high work. So we must stop and examine ourselves. Is there something wrong about the way in which I'm doing that work? Let every man examine himself. I examine myself in this pulpit as I speak. It is possible for a man to preach with a carnal energy. And if he does, he will sooner or later be suffering from this spiritual exhaustion, this spiritual depression. But then a still more important and a much more spiritual question again is this. I must ask myself, why have I been doing the work? What has really been my motive? Here I am, I've been very active and I've been very busy. At first it was so remarkable, it was so enjoyable. It was all such a great thrill to me. Now I find it's become a burden and I'm tired and I'm weary. Now then ask this question. Uh, Why really have you been doing it the whole time? Oh, it's a terrible question that. Because, you know, it may be the first time you've ever asked it. You've taken it for granted that your motive was a good one and a pure one, but you sometimes will find that it wasn't. You know, there are some people who work simply for the sake of the thrill and the excitement. There's no question about it at all. I have seen people working very actively in Christian work. I have had no doubt myself, and subsequent experience of them has taught me that I was right, that what they were really concerned about was the thrill and the excitement. There are some people who are never happy unless they're doing something. They'll rush from one activity to the other. They don't always realize it, but what they're really out for is the thrill and the excitement. And uh, certainly as we live on that sort of thing, we'll get exhausted, we will become weary, we will become tired. Or let me put it like this. Our greatest enemy may have come in, and that is self. Perhaps really we've been doing all we've been doing simply to satisfy self in order to please ourselves, in order to be able to say to ourselves how wonderful we are and how much we are doing. Oh, this subtle, foul, terrible enemy self that follows us everywhere. We like to say it's for the glory of God, it's often for my own glory. Self, so that we are busy, that we are important. We say we don't want the praise, of course, to God be the glory. And we say we're only giving the results, not that people may look at us, but that God may have the glory. And yet we are giving the results, you see. And it appears in the papers and so on. Self has come in. And self is a terrible master. If we're working to satisfy and to please self in any shape or form, the end is always going to be weariness and tiredness. Self is a poor master to work for. So we've got to ask ourselves the question about the motive. Why have I been doing it all? And then lastly, a very important question in self-examination, I think, is this. Has this work, I wonder, kept me going? Instead of being my work, has it been the sort of mainspring of my life? I'm sure there are many present who know exactly what I mean by that. One of the greatest dangers in the spiritual life is to live on your own activities. In other words, the activity isn't in the right place as something which you do. No, it's something that keeps you going. I've seen some of the greatest tragedies I've seen in this very connection in such men. Men who didn't realize it, but they'd been going for years simply in the force and the momentum of their own activities. Their own activities had kept them going. And then when perhaps they were taken ill or something like that happened, or they were taken, uh, they became old men and they could no longer do what they used to do. They became depressed. 
They didn't know what to do with themselves when they had to sit in a corner. Why? Well, they'd been living on their own activities. They'd been kept going by the momentum. I suppose it is the disease of civilization. I suppose this is the greatest cause of neurasthenia and the neuroses and the psychosis at the present time. That unfortunately the world has become so mad that we're all being kept going by this terrific momentum. Instead of being in control and knowing what we're doing and able to do it properly, the thing is controlling us. And it drives us and it presses us until ultimately it exhausts us. Well, very well, there are some of the main elements at any rate in this vital process of self-examination. My dear friends, let me emphasize the principle. If in any respect in your life this morning you are weary, I beseech you, stop and ask these questions. Why am I weary? How have I been carrying on? Examine your whole attitude towards your life and the thing in particular that you're doing. And if you feel it about the whole of the Christian life, and if you're on the point of saying there's nothing in it, I'm giving up. Now I say, stop and ask those questions. Why did you ever come into it? What is it? And so on. But let me put that positively. There are certain great principles, according to the teaching of the Apostle here, which we must recognize if we are to get rid of this condition. Here's the first. There are phases in the Christian life as in the whole of life. Phases. The New Testament talks about our being babes in Christ. It talks about our growing and developing. John writes his epistle to little children and to young men and to old men. There it is. It's spiritual. The Christian life is not always exactly the same. There is a beginning and a continuing, and there is a maturing, and there is an ending. And owing to these phases, there are many variations. Feelings, for instance, are most variable. You expect most feelings at the beginning, and you get most feelings at the beginning. Now, many a person has rarely become weary because certain feelings have gone. They don't realize that what has happened is that they've matured. But because they're not as they were, they say they're all wrong. But as we grow and develop spiritually, these changes must take place. There are various phases. Quite apart from what happens to us, God deals with us in phases. There's no question at all about this. For our own good, he sometimes seems to withdraw himself. There are times when he definitely chastises us. It's the teaching of the scripture. All for our good, all for our development. It's because we are children, we are chastised. If you're not chastised, says the twelfth of Hebrews, you're not children, you're illegitimate. You're not real sons. So all these things obviously are bound to produce changes. Let me put it perhaps simply in the form of an illustration. I happened to see the other day a little child aged about four, I should think, going out of our house with her mother and her brother. And I couldn't help but be attracted by the way the child was doing it. She didn't walk out of the house. She jumped out and skipped out. She gambled out like a lamb. I noticed her mother walked out. The mother didn't come out like the child came out. Well, quite so. Well, very well. Let's be sure that we're not guilty of something like that in our spiritual life. You see, the child is there bounding with energy, superfluous energy in a sense, has not yet learned how to use it and how to control it. The mother of the child had a great deal more energy than the child. But if you looked at them superficially, you would think that it was the child that was bounding with energy and that the mother had very little energy because she walked out slowly. But we know that that isn't so. The energy is much greater in the adult, but it appears to be greater in the child. And because you use this ebullience and this, this excitement and exuberance and this superfluity, so many people think that they've lost something vital and they become weary. Let's recognize the law of development. Let's recognize that there are phases. Let's recognize that there are these stages of development in the Christian life. And sometimes that and that alone will solve the whole problem. But come to a second principle, which is this. Listen to how Paul puts it. Let us not be weary, he says, in well-doing. 
It's well doing, my friend. Now, that's the thing we've tended to forget, isn't it? Ah, we say, there it is, day after day, the same old thing, or week after week. And uh, that's our attitude towards it. And because that is the attitude towards it, that is why we become weary. Paul says, wait a minute, let me remind you that you're in the Christian life. And that the Christian life is well doing. If you regard your Christian life as a task, you're insulting God. What is your Christian life? You see the importance of the questions? Oh, you say, there it is again. I must go on living another day. I mustn't do the things that other people do or in the same profession or work. I've got to walk this straight and narrow road. I say no to this and no to that. I take on these burdens and these duties and I'm engaged in this and Sunday comes. I can't stay in bed. I go to church and all this, this awful task, this terrible life in which I find myself. But that's it, isn't it? And the reply to that is that you're engaged in well-doing. My dear friend, if you and I have come to regard any aspect of this Christian life as a task and as a duty, and that we have to cleanse and set our teeth in order to get through with it, I say we are insulting God. And we've forgotten the very essence of Christianity. What do I mean? I mean this. This isn't a task. The Christian life alone is worthy of the name life. This alone is righteous and holy and pure and good. It's the kind of life that the Son of God himself lived. It's like God himself in his own holiness. That's why I should be doing it. I don't just decide to go on somehow, not at all. I remind myself that it's a great and it's a good life. It's well doing. How have I ever come into this life? I'm grumbling and complaining that it's hard and that it's arduous and that I'm having a very hard and a difficult time. Let me ask this question. How did you ever come into this Christian life? Here you are on this narrow way about which you're grumbling so much. How did you ever come from that broad way on which you were once walking? What's made the difference? And you ask that question and there's only one answer. I've come from that to this. Because the only begotten Son of God left heaven and came down to earth, having divested himself of the insignia of his eternal glory, and humbled himself and was born as a babe and put in a manger and endured the life of this world for 33 years and was spat upon and reviled and had a crown of thorns thrust into his head and was nailed upon a cross and bore the punishment of my sins. That's how I've come from this to this. And if I ever find myself, even for a fraction of a second, doubting the greatness and the glory and the wonder and the nobility of this walk in which I'm engaged, well then, I'm spitting upon him. Out upon the suggestion. Be not weary in well-doing, my friend. You've no right to look at yourself like that, nor your life like that, nor anything you're doing like that. And if you think of your Christian living in any sense or, or shape or form, with this sense of grudge or of task or of duty or of weariness, I say to you, go back to the beginning for a moment. Retrace your steps mentally to the wicked gate through which you passed. Remember the slough of despond. Look at the world rotting in evil and in sin. Look at the hell that's awaiting it. And then look back and look forward. And realize that you're set in the most glorious campaign in which a man, into which a man can ever enter. And that you're on the noblest road that the world has ever known. But let me go on and put it like this. The next principle is that this life of ours is but a preparatory one. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season he shall reap if we faint not. Oh, come back and look at your life and put it into the context of eternity. 
You're tired, you're weary, you find it's almost too much for you and you can't keep going. Stop and say to yourself, what is this? What is this life as a whole? What is it? What's it all mean? Well, it's all nothing but a preparatory school. This life is but the antechamber of eternity. And all we have in this world is but anticipatory of that. Your greatest joys are but the first fruits and the foretaste of an eternal joy that is coming. Oh, how important it is to do that. You see, the sheer grind of life gets us down. Yes, I've got to get up and do this today. Men says that in business. A man may say it in the Christian life. A minister may say it. Another Sunday comes. I've got to prepare two sermons. I've got to preach twice. What a terrible thing. But the sheer grind sometimes almost gets us to that. And the answer to that, I say, is to look at it all and put it into its great context and see that we are but pilgrims going to eternity and this is but the preparatory school. And what a difference that makes. Oh, yes, but let me put it still more strongly by putting it like this. Keep on, says Paul, with your farming. Why? Because of the certainty of the harvest that is coming. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And the moment you realize something about the harvest, you won't faint, my friend. The sight of the harvest is what we need. The world is too much with us. That's our trouble. We are too immersed in our problems and perplexities. Look ahead, I say. Anticipate. Look forward. Have the grand view. Try to see the eternal glories gleaming afar. It's all there. Every joy in the Christian life is but, I say again, a tasting of the first fruits of the great harvest which is to come. My dear friend, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Realize the place to which you are going. That's the antidote. That's the cure. The harvest we shall reap. It's certain. It's absolute. Therefore, says Paul to the Corinthians, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Go on with your task, whatever your feelings. Keep on with your work. God will give the increase. He'll send the rain. There will be an abundant harvest. Look forward to the harvest. He shall reap. And on top of it all, let us consider the master for whom we work. Let us remember how he endured and how patient he was. Oh, take that mighty argument of the twelfth of Hebrews again. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. He did. He came down and he endured it all, I say. And how patient he was. Oh, how humdrum his life must have seemed to him at times, with ordinary petty people misunderstanding him and so on. But he went on and he didn't complain. And how did he do it? For the joy that was set before him. He endured even the cross, despising the shame. That's how he did it. It was the joy that was set before him. He knew the crowning that was coming. He knew the harvest that he was going to reap. And seeing that, he was able not to see these other things and to go through gloriously and triumphantly. And you and I have the privilege of being like him. If any man will be my disciple, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that's it, and follow me. And he'll give you the honor of even suffering for his name. Paul says it's the most extraordinary thing to say in writing to the Colossians that he has the privilege of making up in his own body what remains of the sufferings of Christ. And what if you weary Christian are having the same privilege without knowing it? Well, very well, remind yourself of your blessed master. And look to him. 
and ask him to forgive you for ever having allowed yourself to be wary. Look at it all again in this way, and as certainly as you do so, you will find that you're filled with a new hope and a new strength and a new power. You won't need your artificial stimulants or anything else. You'll just find that you are again thrilled with the privilege and the joy of it all and the love of such a Lord and Savior, such a marvelous master. And you'll hate yourself for having grumbled and complained and for having shuffled along the road. And you'll go forward as you did go forward and still more gloriously. And on and on you'll go until eventually you'll hear him saying, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter in to the joy of thy Lord. Amen.